The Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency's mission is to find and recover American service members who were taken prisoner of war or were missing in action in past conflicts. Kelly McKegg is the director of the agency. Kelly, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. It's a privilege to be on your program. So your efforts go all the way back to World War II. How many service members are you searching for? Surprisingly, they're close to 82,000 that are missing from World War II through Operation Iraqi Freedom. Of that, we estimate 38,000 to be recoverable, the remainder being deep water at sea losses. And how many have been uh, recovered so far this year? Last year, last fiscal year, we identified 166, predominantly from World War II, 134, but also 30 from Korean War, as well as two from Vietnam. So let's talk about that process. Let's go through the steps. What's the first step in the process of searching for remains? It always begins with research. Our historians, our analysts, our intel specialists all dive through wartime records, field activity records, as well as archives to build that piece that might be able to take an area this size, reduce it to that. At that point, we will send a field investigation team to search for clues, and if successful, to get it down to here, we will send an archaeologist or anthropologist-led team with which to excavate and recover what we hope to be remains. And what are some of the tools that you have to narrow down that, that search? It's incredible from the standpoint that our historians and researchers pour through volumes of records to, again, narrow the field that we look for. And then we have the most talented anthropologists and archaeologists that can take modern techniques and literally scour a field up to sometimes six meters deep in order to find the remains of, say, a crash site. And, you know, you talked about doing research to find a probable site. What research is out? Is this public information? Do you do interviews with people? Is it history? What do you do? It's all of that. Primarily going through archival records, uh, unit histories, wartime battlefield records, as well as interviewing witnesses. Now, obviously, in World War II, these are secondhand witnesses oftentimes. But in the case of Vietnam, it's often firsthand witnesses but again, they're aging, they're dying, so time is against us. You're also developing new ways to identify remains, including chest x-rays. It's absolutely incredible. We have two forensic laboratories, the most predominant skeletal human skeletal labs in the world. Uh, they utilize a number of techniques. We use seven lines of evidence to identify an American. It begins with anthropological analysis, their bones. You relate, you, you mentioned chest x-rays. I never knew this. Your collarbone, your clavicle, is as unique as a fingerprint. So if our scientists are able to recover a clavicle from the field and we have the individual's chest x-ray from when they entered the service, they can do a match that literally prioritizes that clavicle against 60,000 x-rays to find that match. We also use dental remains if we find them. Again, comparing them against dental records from World War II, Korean War, or Vietnam. The most promising and most technologically advanced method of identification is DNA. And if we are able to have a family member's DNA on file, we can match that DNA using three DNA types, mitochondrial, nuclear, as well as autosomal. Our partner at the Armed Forces Medical Examiner Service at uh, Dover Air Force Base is incredible they are able to take degraded DNA that has been doused with formaldehyde to preserve the remains back during the war. It's been proven that that extraction technique is harder to get DNA from than 30,000-year-old Neanderthal remains. Mm. Absolutely incredible. You have a lab at Offutt Offit Air Force Base. What's there? What's going on there? So we have two laboratories. The original one is in Honolulu at Joint Book Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. Our second laboratory is in Omaha, Nebraska at Offutt Air Force Base. The scientists at Offutt Air Force Base tr take care of all the remains that come from Europe, whereas everything from the Indo-Pacific region comes through the laboratory in Honolulu. Both are staffed by incredible odontologists, forensic dentists, anthropologists, archaeologists, as well as material evidence specialists. There are times, I understand, where you could get, um, there could be different service members or other people with those remains. How are you able to um, understand, you know, who's who and to 
really specify that? One of the most unique techniques that our scientists have come out with and patented by again getting it certified and accredited is what they call isotope testing. What you eat and drink as a young person stays with you for life. So we are able to determine where you might have grown up. And so we're able to differentiate and segregate the remains by an American versus somebody that grew up in Asia or someplace in Europe. The water you drink, the food you eat, marks you literally through these isotopes. And not only that, but we're able to segregate here in the United States regionally by determining, did you grow up in the Midwest? Did you grow up in the Northeast or, or South? And you know, some missing service members are in anonymous graves. How do you determine when to disinter those in um, those remains um, to, to test them and to do all the, the scientific testing that you can do? So 20% of the 38,000 that we estimate to be recoverable are buried as an unknown somewhere in a US controlled cemetery, Europe, here in the United States, or in the Philippines. This is their final resting place shortly after the war. What we, the onus is on us to prove to our superiors at the Pentagon that there's a higher than probability that we can identify should we be able to disinter. So we will put together a very voluminous package that looks at historical background, that looks at forensic records that are on file, that says we think this person, this unknown in this grave might be service member so-and-so. All right, we're gonna take a pause here and then we'll continue. On the other side of the break, we'll continue our conversation with Kelly McKegg, Director of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. We'll be right back. We're back with Kelly McKegg, Director of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency. So Kelly, there are also efforts to, under, to recover underwater remains. I would imagine that's a lot more complicated. It is, and right now we are limited to about 200 feet of water. Anything beyond that technology limits us, but we are embarking upon a test with the United States Navy on what they call saturation dive, which allows divers to stay underwater, stay underwater for longer periods of time, and that can get us down to 1,000 feet. And we're also using underwater robotics, unmanned little robots that can scour a debris field in a record time and allow our scientists to be able to dive in a specific area. You know, in, in a lot of instances, especially when we're talking about the Pacific, the U.S. is working with countries that used to be our enemies. How is that and how did that come about? It really is an incredible story. Uh, Ten years after the Viet end of the Vietnam War, the United States and Vietnam entered into the Paris Peace Accords. And from that, we were able to offered to Vietnam that this was important to us. There were still over 2,000 missing from the Vietnam War. And so Vietnam knew, this was 10 years before normalization, before President Clinton restored the embassy and diplomatic relations. 10 years after the end of the war, 10 years before normalization, Vietnam started cooperating with the United States. That dates back to 1985. And in that time, over 1,200, almost 1,300 missing service members from Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia have been recovered and identified. It incredibly speaks to the humanitarian nature of this work, that countries use this as a, the United States uses this with countries that we work with as a tool of engagement, a tool of diplomacy. And here Vietnam, in the height of economic sanctions, in the height of penalties, trusted the United States to cooperate on this, and they've been doing so for 37 years. And, and you, you're working in 46 countries. That's a, that's a lot of, it's a lot of part of the globe. We are, and the, literally it's where an American fell in combat. 75% of the losses are in the Indo-Pacific region, the other 25% in Europe. I mean, were you able to still keep working though during COVID? Because, I mean, you couldn't even travel. At the height, when the start of COVID, we had 32 teams that were deployed somewhere in the world. We immediately brought them home in March of 2020. And for 10 months, we were prevented from traveling, obviously because no one knew the extent of COVID. But even in that time, we utilize US trained teams in Vietnam to unilaterally excavate these sites. Vietnam, in those 10 months, actually did 13 excavations unilaterally. We utilize 
private partners in countries that had no travel restrictions once you were in. And so whether it was Papua New Guinea, whether it was Germany or Poland, we used universities in those countries to do the work during those 10 months we were prevented from entering. You know, your agency is fairly new. It was established in 2015. Um, what were these efforts like before your office was created and, and why was it created? It was, so DPAA, Defense POW MI Accounting Agency, was formed by Secretary Hagel in 2015. It's an amalgamation of three different organizations. But prior to that, these organizations continued to do the research, the analysis, as well as the recoveries and identification. The history of the program actually dates back shortly after World War II in 1947, when the American Graves Registration Service established this concept, this mission, and this capability. And over time, temporary laboratories were set up in Japan, in Thailand, but today it's a permanent presence that really dates back and I think a lot of credit goes to the family members of the Vietnam War MIAs who banded together in a grassroots effort, raised the consciousness of the nation. They designed the black and white iconic POW flag that we're all familiar with. And those mothers, wives, daughters, sons, all raised the consciousness. And from that, we have this very unique and more importantly, cutting edge mission today. And, and I know that this is very personally important to you, this, this type of work. Is there a particular story of a recovery that really resonated with you? We always say, Mimi, that despite the fact that we're looking for 38,000 that we estimate to be recoverable, every single one of those 38,000 is, 38, is more than a number. Each one has a unique story that dates back, and it's intergenerational. Family members know about their loved one. You may be talking to a third second generation family member, and it's as if you're talking to the grandmother. I remember a story, in fact, right here in our backyard, uh, Sergeant Roy, Army Sergeant Roy DeLauder, uh, he was from Smithburg, Maryland, which is near Hagerstown. He was a 21 year old who went off to war right after Korean War hostilities broke out. He was lost in December of 1950. He was one of 13 children. You remember the 55 boxes that were part of the Singapore summit that President Trump and Chairman Kim had negotiated. And these 55 boxes, North Korea turned over to the United States readily. Uh, no conditions. Uh, we ended up delineating 250 individuals. Sergeant Roy DeLauder was actually in two boxes, box 27, box 41. We identify him from those boxes. We repatriate him three sisters, all in their 90s, are still alive. Two daughters, Charlene and Sue, were three and one and a half when their dad went missing. You can only imagine that the town of Smithburg, in fact, all of Hagerstown, came together that Friday afternoon. It would have been Roy's 90th birthday on that day. Absolutely incredible stories. But again, it speaks to our nation. It speaks to the values that we as Americans share. And it's something that, again, transcends. And you personally go to the funerals I when go, they're local. I go to as many as I can in Arlington. Uh, one that I think is worthy of your, your uh, listeners and your viewers hearing about is on September 14th, Lieutenant Colonel Addison Baker was a B-24 pilot. He was older. He was actually a group commander that led the Operation Tidal Wave. It was the largest bombing mission, 177 bombers, went toward the oil fields in Romania to literally take out refineries. Lieutenant Colonel Baker was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor for his heroism and valor in the skies. He personally, despite his aircraft being severely damaged, brought that entire armada toward the oil refineries. He was buried one of the unknowns that you mentioned about, he was buried shortly after the war in a temporary cemetery in Romania. American Graves Registration Service finds him, can't identify him. They bury him in Ardennes National Cemetery, American Cemetery in Belgium. We disinter, we identify him. And you found him. We found him. He was the middle of three children. His niece, two nephews are there. They remember his, their uncle buzzing the home every time he came back to Ohio. 
Kelly, thanks so much for being on the program. Maybe a priv privilege, and thank you again for all you do and what government matters and defense matters does. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.